for 2023 uh, math ed forum. Uh, today we'll be uh, talking de-streaming in mathematics, a progress report. Uh, so uh, as many have mentioned already uh, in the past uh, months, years, uh, this is a bit of a return um, in terms of de-streaming. Uh, and um, you know, now that it's been in the field for a couple of years, uh, it's, um, it's worth chiming in and hearing from the different perspectives uh, on how it's going. So today's session is organized by uh, Dr. Dragana Martinovich, uh, who's uh, in, in person today, as well as uh, Paul Alves, who is online. Before we get started, I just wanna uh, begin by acknowledging the land on the Fields Institute, um, on which the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences resides, is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we'd like to acknowledge and express gratitude to the Mississaugas of the Credit, First Nation, and the Anishinaabek peoples who continue to share their ancestral lands with us. Uh, just a quick uh, a couple of points. So all the sessions are recorded. So for those who want to uh, check out the videos, they do come online within a few weeks. Uh, if For those who are connecting online, you are muted by default, um, uh, but uh, we do ask uh, uh, to re you know, remain uh, muted on your microphone or keep your video off unless you're looking to share. And finally, uh, we always encourage a good uh, and respectful discourse uh, in the forum. Uh, we have a couple of reports. Um, and um, actually, before I get into those from the forum, is there any reports from any of the math ed organizations uh, uh, that, would, uh, that anyone would want to bring forward? OK. Uh, so the first thing uh, we'll note is that we do have a research uh, research day coming up in January, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this upcoming January, and we'll be looking for our proposals uh, for those who have research that they'd like to present in the context of the forum. Uh, so just stay tuned for that email. Uh, anyone who's registered uh, for the forum uh, will be on the mailing list, will be receiving that. The other uh, point of note is that next month we will not be meeting in person, we will be meeting online, uh, and we're actually gonna be uh, kind of joined with the uh, CMS online meeting that's taking place on the same weekend. Uh, so uh, it starts at 1 p.m. on the Saturday, November 25th. And it goes on, I believe, to the next day. Uh, so uh, if you want to take a look, an early look at the agenda of uh, that session, you can take a look at it on the Winter 23 CMS math site. Um, but we do want to uh, just indicate as participants of the Math Ed Forum, uh, you are on a special list. Uh, where uh, you will be getting access uh, to the um, to the registration as part of your membership in the forum. So uh, you'll be getting an email uh, to invite you to the uh, to the November session by default. Now, if you know anyone who might want to participate or attend uh, the uh, through the math forum, uh, you can let them know. We'll be having a, an invitation link also going out. All right, uh, I'm going to pass it over to. Um, uh, uh, to the speakers uh, quite shortly, uh, but I'll just start off uh, with a quick intro for the day. I don't know, Dragana, if you wanted to go over this one. Quick overview, yeah. Thank you, Charles. Uh, so today's session is about de-streaming Ontario curriculum and curriculum in general. Ontario was the last to, to start de-streaming uh, grade nine uh, of mathematics and of now science as well. So we would like to hear about what is happening in the field. Obviously we have a research team that is investigating that and we would like to hear their results. So stay tuned throughout the day. We'll be talking about benefits of streaming and de-streaming and uh, everybody's experience as students, parents and teachers. Uh, so for our first session of the day, we'll have Doug McDougall, uh, Sophia uh, Freo uh, Maziers, Jeremy Labrie, and Jason Toe uh, uh, coming online. Uh, the second panel uh, will be starting at 11, uh, and that'll be with Anthony Melly, Jamie Mitchell, and Lisa Sertan. Uh, uh, so we'll be breaking for lunch at 12, uh, and then rejoining for general discussion, uh, for those who can participate, uh, from 1 to 3. And with that, I'll hand it over to the first set of presenters. Okay. 
Okay, great, very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us here today. We're thrilled to have an opportunity to talk about our research and some of the work that we're doing. Uh, and uh, so our next is I'm going to take a few minutes, introduce the team. Uh, we won't need to do the land acknowledgement. We just did it. Great, thanks. We'll talk a little bit about our grade nine mathematics research, the highlights in the research, share with you some of our findings. It's a, so far a three-year project. Talk a little bit about what we did through the interviews, a little bit about the professional learning workshops that we were doing, and then finally the workshops that we're doing this year, and a few comments at the end. We will stop about 10, 50 or so, give you an opportunity for some questions you have it. Uh, welcome to those who are online. Uh, great to have you here and join us uh, virtually. The first is the introduction to the team. So again, my name is Doug McDougall. I'm chair of the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning at OIZ. Uh, I've had a number of different roles as secondary elementary school teacher. And I started at the university and I've been uh, chair for 10 years ago, uh, associate dean and back to being chair again. So lots of things about mathematics and I'm going to just introduce and, and uh, take a moment uh, Sophia uh, is, is here from Wilfrid Laurier University, has been part and a project manager. Jeremy Labrie is sitting with us, going to speak today. Uh, a number of other people who are on here, and we also have uh, Kelly Zhang, who's here in the audience with us, uh, is also a member of the team. And from the TDSB team that we've been working with most closely, but other teams, Jason Toe, who's at the airport right now, but online, and uh, we hope that we're able to get him connected at exactly the moment where we want him to say a few words. And then a couple of Murphy, Salo, and Mukasa Roman from TDSB. So starting with the highlights, this uh, actually started much earlier than what we're going to do for today. I've been working for 10 years in grade nine mathematics applied uh, teacher with applied teachers and working with students for quite a number of years in quite a number of school districts. And when the new curriculum came, I thought it was really important here in Ontario to have a SHRC grant that might investigate the implementation of what that might look like. And so as many of you here from Ontario know that the curriculum uh, landed on our doorstep in June and it was going to start in September. And there were no materials online that were that useful for teachers and we wanted to know what they were trying to do to make that happen. De-streaming occurs in a variety of different places around uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, and around the world. Uh, but what we wanted to do is what happened if, if we were going to do this in Ontario. So we're actually focusing on what were some of the theoretical and practical understandings of what it meant when you're introducing a new curriculum. Although for many of us who've been around a long time, we remember the old times when we actually had a de-stream mathematics for a short period of time, and then we moved back to having uh, the one that we streamed and we had here. We had some research questions. We were really interested in what are these teachers going to do to go from a two stream, three stream system into one stream? What does that look like in a classroom? What are they going to do with this wide range of student abilities? The second thing we wanted to know is what are some of the practices and challenges they have when they implement and start to use a new curriculum in grade nine? We also wanted to know what resources and, and supports they needed in order to make it successful. And finally, we wanted to get a sense of what professional development activities would and could be useful for teachers as they embark on learning a new curriculum. So we indicated that there are three phases. The first phase was interviews. We wanted to know from teachers who were just getting started what it meant to look at this new curriculum. We had 37 teachers from three school districts in Ontario, and then we went to Calgary, where we had 11 teachers and five principals because they've been doing de-stream math for over 15 years. And we wanted to know what we can learn from that group. In the year two, which was last year, we had two cohorts of 50 teachers each in, the, uh, in one school district in Ontario, and then we had half-day workshops in Calgary, uh, which was another partner. Then in year three, which is the one we're in now, we have two cohorts of also around 50 teachers in one school district, and we'll talk a little bit of what it looks like. Throughout all of this work, we developed a website of resources 
uh, that's there. We have a few minutes at the end. We can show it to you. Uh, and that's where we wanted to house all of the new things that we were working on and things for teachers, resources. Our design was that we were using qualitative research. So we were focusing on working, first of all, with the interviews. But we we're also using a survey that helped us identify what teachers thought were the most important elements or dimensions or factors they wanted to investigate while they were doing this work. We then uh, had actually created some case studies. So all of those teachers and principals that we talked about earlier, and there's uh, over 50 teachers and the five principals so far, they're all cases. We de developed a case around each of those teachers to get a sense of what happened. All of their uh, contexts are different. They're working in different schools in different parts in the province, and they give us a chance to learn a little bit more. We're using the semi-structured interviews. Uh, we're also uh, having a survey, as I mentioned, and a document review. We take a look at some of their lesson plans. We look at some of their student work to get a sense of what they're doing and what they think is important that's happening in the classroom. These cases then uh, are analyzed uh, individually. We're using in vivo 12 at this point to help us uh, with the emerging themes that we have. What we're going to talk about in a few minutes are what those themes are and give you a little insight on those. But before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the framework that we're using. There's lots of frameworks that, that can be used about teacher change and the implementation of curriculum. But one of the things that I've been working on, as many of you know, for 10 or 15 years, is, how, is uh, what we ref I refer to as 10 dimensions of mathematics education. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to describe what they are so that you can see when we do the findings, how they all fit together. This was developed probably about 20 years ago when it was taking a look at textbook and math change in a school district in Ontario. And what they were doing was changing the textbook from one, te from one version to the new one. 20 years ago, we had a lot of new textbooks that came out. And we found that the teachers were struggling with what to do and how to, how to implement that, that resource in their classroom. To that, we interviewed 56 teachers and uh, asked them over 75 questions about their teaching practice. Realized that 75 questions were never going to be uh, a good way to do a survey, so we did some analysis and we narrowed it down to 20 questions, which people seem to be okay with. We then uh, worked with about 2,000 different teachers to get some of their data, those 56 teachers, and from that emerged the 10 dimensions, this, these 10 dimensions. So really, what are the characteristics of what happens in the classroom? So the first one is about the program scope and planning. So we wanted to find out and have a sense from teachers of how are they teaching their strands? How are they integrating them if they are? How are they looking at the mathematical processes? And are they using big ideas, key ideas to make connections between other ones? I mentioned two is about meeting individual needs. And that is for the teacher to use a variety of instructional practices so that and approaches so that the students would understand what they're focusing on and a chance for differentiating instruction. Dimension three is about the learning environment. How's the classroom organized? Is it grouped in individual tables, in pairs, in clusters of four or five or six? We also wanted to know what's in the walls, what's around the classroom. What is it, what does the teacher do in terms of giving feedback? And also, is there any student choice or input? How are they involved in this classroom? Or is it just the teacher uh, who focuses on what's going on and what takes place. Dimension four is about the tasks and the different kinds of tasks that happens in the classroom. So we want to get a sense of whether or not there's some meaningful and engaging practice. How do students learn to, to practice and learn about it? What are some of the rich tasks that they might be involved in? Are the, are the problems that they're working embedded in meaningful contexts or are they just generic contexts? Do the students understand? Can they make connections? And what does the modeling and representation look like? Are they doing that? Are the, is the teacher doing that? Dimension five is about constructing knowledge. And it's how do teachers proceed in their practices that help the students understand what they're doing? Does the teacher just believe that they can just talk and the students are going to listen and they'll do it? Or is there actually engagement that takes place there? Uh, what are the types of questions are being asked? Is there any wait time? The teachers just ask a question, add a third question, fourth question, just keep going, or is there some kind of interaction that takes place? Dimension six is about communicating with parents. How does the teacher communicate what's happening in the classroom? How do they share what's going on about the student's progress? 
and also what do they talk about in the mathematics program. And as many of you who've been doing research have a good sense, and teachers of course have a really good sense, that there are some parents out there who want you to do exactly what they did. Give me lots of worksheets because I was successful in worksheets, I need to see them. And there are other parents who worked with worksheets and said, I don't want to ever see one with my child ever, do something else. We have these different experiences of parents and what does a teacher do to try to engage those parents because it's a really good partner. I mentioned seven is about the use of technology and manipulatives, how they're being used, are they being used, and are they being used appropriately, and how do we integrate technology in a variety of different ways. I mentioned eight is about student uh, communication and the form of communication, oral and written communication, uh, graphic, pictorial communication, and physical communication. How are we engaging the students in that classroom so that they can learn? I mentioned nine is about assessment, assessment for learning and of learning, and whether or not there's a variety and for learning um, as learning as well, and a variety of assessment tools that are being used, and whether or not it's transparent. Are, do the students understand what the assessment is about? I mentioned 10 is about the teacher's attitude and comfort with mathematics. Do I feel comfortable? Uh, in my classrooms, I always had the I love math button I carried around. With my attitude, I love math. I want to make that sure that that's in the classroom. But there's a lot of teachers that don't have that in feeling, that emotion when they start thinking about mathematics. So we want to think about how their comfort with the content and with the credit, the pedagogy that they're able to use. The survey that I mentioned about a few minutes ago has 20 questions. They all link back into these 10 dimensions. So as the participants complete that survey, then they're able to identify, since they're, they're rated one to six, six being um, sort of more towards uh, reform, our understanding and research, and one closer to a traditional uh, non-engaging uh, type of activity, then some of those Averages are going to be quite high, which indicates that they're probably doing some really interesting things in that dimension. And some are quite low, indicating that probably could use some professional development. We use that to identify which areas that we might want to work on. Then what we did was we actually interviewed a whole bunch of teachers and in the first year, and I'm going to now pass it over to Sophia, who will talk about some of our findings. Thank you, Doug. So now we're going to go over the interview findings and they're going to be categorized using the 10 dimensions. Now I want you to think back that these are findings from 2021 to 2022 um, and 2021 was when the new grade nine curriculum came out. So I want you to put your, yourself in that lens because then we'll take you to what happened in 2022 and then, and then now 2023. So under program scope and planning, we found that the teachers were using a variety of uh, methods to plan. So they were either doing it by styling or they were planning by units or they were actually just planning day to day. Um, so, so it was not consistent with all of the teachers that we interviewed. The other thing is that during that, that time period, they were requesting for planning times. They kept saying, we need some more planning time, right? And we need time to, to be together to discuss different strategies and what works and what doesn't work. They did mention um, that the turnaround day between both semesters, so they were given a day uh, between both semesters to actually plan with, with teachers within their schools and then other schools, and they found that very effective. Under meeting individual needs, a lot of teachers talked about uh, being a math doctor, and what they referred to that was uh, that they would have to diagnose their, their students, so uh, what areas they needed to work on, and then help them catch up to that grade, grade nine uh, level. They also talked a lot about the use of open-ended questions to, to address that, as well as that they were having a lot of challenges with struggling students in their classroom. A lot of um, teachers also asked uh, for, uh, for resources that had a variety of um, the various degrees of difficulty levels um, to go along with those open-ended questions. Under the learning environment, uh, we found a lot of practices that come from the building thinking classroom. Uh, so they spoke about group work, right, the visibly random grouping, as well as uh, other strategies like self-selected groups. Uh, and they also talked a lot about vertical non-permanent surfaces. And some teachers actually mentioned that uh, senior level students, so grade 12 students, would be helping them in their class during the, the group work that they established. And they found that was, a, was, was helpful. When we're looking at student tasks, 
uh, we asked them what type of tasks do you use in your grade nine classrooms? And again, this is in the beginning in 2021. A lot of them took questions from openmiddle.com, so that website, as well as EQAO questions, and then made them into an open task. Some talked about uh, using parallel tasks in their classrooms, as well as scaffolding activities from textbook, from grade nine uh, textbooks from the past. Um, and then when we're talking about constructing knowledge, we didn't really gather enough data in here, but we did find that some, um, some teachers addressed asking questions. That was a very important part of their process, as well as creating stations around the room with questions that students could pick and choose from. When we asked them about um, how do they communicate with parents and what does that involvement look like, a lot of them um, talked about the fact that uh, families were not aware of the curriculum change, right? So the teachers were aware, the school boards were aware, but they were not, but the families were not aware that this was a new course. Uh, and then, but they did find that there was concern from families that had high achieving students on expectation, um, for expectations, as well as the other extreme where families from struggling students also had concerns. And that was for the ones uh, that did know about, about the change, right? So. For the most part, they, a lot of families didn't know about it, but for the ones that did, uh, those were the concerns there. When we asked them about their technology practice as well as manipulatives in their classrooms, almost all teachers mentioned Desmos, so it's a very, very popular resource that they use in their classroom. And when it came to coding, there was a wide range of teacher knowledge when it came to coding. And same with the programs and softwares that they use, so from Scratch, for, Scratch Python, Replit, Overly, so very, um, uh, softwares, but uh, but it really really talked about the the knowledge. So some were very experts in the in coding, and others were very new or were hesitant to to put that in their classrooms. When it came to manipulatives, uh, there was a there was a mention of some algebra child uh, and some virtual manipulatives, but not a lot came out of that part. In when we're talking about student mathematical communication. Uh, there was a little bit of mention on using math talks as a strategy, as well as think alouds, uh, but we wanted to explore that a little bit further because it was just the surface level that, that they told us about. Assessment was a big piece on when we were speaking with the teachers, and assessment was a topic that teachers would like to improve upon, so they kept asking for more professional development, right, more conversations around assessment, but the, what they did mention was that consistent and formative feedback was key for the success of their students and that they were trying to move away from, from standardized testing into assessments and they were trying parallel assessments and leveled assessments in their classrooms. So they were really starting to, to try that in their classrooms, but they wanted um, a little bit more on that because they felt it was very challenge, challenging to implement. The last one, um, although this is under teachers' attitudes and comfort with mathematics, we went into a, a approach of how comfortable are you with these streaming, right? So that's what we asked in this category. And so there was two sides of, of, um, uh, of the responses. One was that they were very overwhelmed by this. Uh, they were very skeptical or not a fan. So somebody said, uh, students can scrape by with a 50% but how will they feel about mathematics, right, when they go into grade 10? Um, and then others were really excited because of that idea of students benefiting equally. So now I'll talk a little bit on the challenges that we saw. So one of the biggest challenges uh, was the lack of teacher support. So they felt that maybe they were pressured by the, the board and that this will work, so they felt they had to make it work. Um, others uh, said that there was a lack of professional sessions. So in 2021, 2022, there was no professional sessions um, given on, on specifically grade nine D streaming. Uh, so they felt that they weren't supported enough. Uh, they were given resources though. So they, they did, did, did say that they were grateful for the resources, but they wanted to know how, right? So how do we implement this? Not just given the materials. Uh, they also wanted to talk about specific scenarios, so coming, you know, with examples from their classroom, and then how do we address how do we address with, um, these these issues with our students? Uh, they also expressed that they would like some sessions on coding, and um, time to exchange ideas with other grade nine teachers, and time to understand parallel assessments and and actually be able to work on it. So again, it was a lot of time given for them to work together. The other thing uh, they asked for. Um, 
is that they they would like a textbook so they said there was no textbook or there was limited resources on the on the new areas that was integrated like coding and financial literacy so they were asking for more examples needed in a forum or a google drive which then that's that's how we it led to the website creation here um, again, this is 2021, so just remembering 2021, there were, uh, they were talking about curriculum that there was no specific expectations, it was too vague, and that the curriculum was released too, too late. If you go now and see all of the examples, right, it's much, much better developed, so again, putting your lens back into 2020, uh, 2021. And the other issue here was that it was too much to cover, so they were saying if you are going to put things in, uh, why not take some things out? So that was one of um, their challenges. And lastly, on student math knowledge uh, gaps, they, they just expressed difficulty with the different ends of the spectrum uh, and with their students, as well as, as having students that were, were thinking in basic operations versus, versus those abstract thinkers. When it came to classroom support and size, um, they, they mentioned that there was no support and large class sizes. Uh, although some, some teachers were given an EA and they, they said, uh, some of them said that it was helpful. Others uh, actually mentioned it was not because they were not math oriented. Um, and a few of them actually mentioned that small classes sizes would be helpful. So after finding all of these um, teacher findings from the first year, it led to a series of workshops in 2022 and 2023. And this professional learning workshops had a variety of, of areas that we tried to address. And one of them was uh, the planning. So planning um, using the spiraling approach. So with our teachers, we talked a lot about, um, you know, what is spiraling, right? And uh, we got them to understand the concept of spiraling, right? So it's not teaching units in isolation, but rather it's revisiting concepts over and over again. And then we also had to make sure that they understood why, right? So the big, the big piece was, why do we spiral? And, and if they understood why they spiraled, then they were more likely to implement them in their classrooms. And the other uh, big piece was the keys to starting spiraling. So how do we go about doing that, right? So, so now that we know what it is and why we should do it, how do we go about approaching that? And so there was um, a series, uh, you know, a series of, of days that, that were given to, to spiraling to show them examples of what it looks like for what it looks like for unit teaching versus spiraling teaching, as well as some course um, course plans and what that would look like. So this one is from the, the ministry website. And then we went through each cycle and showed them examples of what that would look like in their classroom. Now that was in 2022-2023. And um, through those findings, we um, we the teachers found that uh, even though we gave examples of coding, it was very light and they wanted to know a little bit more. How do I do that in my classroom, right? You're telling me, you're showing me a beautiful example, but I don't even know how to print something um, in, in, let's say, Python language. So that led into our coding workshop, which we have our wonderful um, uh, workshop leader that he uh, does a lot, uh, is a big, big part of our coding workshops. And I'll get Jeremy to talk about what we're doing this year. Uh, we've done already three sessions of four, uh, but he'll talk all about that. It's on now? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so like, uh, like was mentioned before, the coding workshops were a response to some of the, um, the interviews that we conducted. Um, the idea was that uh, teachers felt like they were um, like they were very anxious with the coding part, especially because it was new. And many were entering the new DStream curriculum without having done any coding before in their careers or in their schooling from the past. And so uh, it was important for teachers to feel like if they were going into the classroom and doing coding with students, that they could feel comfortable with the concepts that they were using, especially when they had to incorporate it throughout the curriculum uh, in the mathematical modeling strand and in bigger problems that the students were solving. And so uh, for us, when we were doing this work, uh, we wanted to make sure that teachers felt comfortable with the coding strand and, and those who had never seen any of that material before were going to be able to learn the foundations of coding that were necessary for success in the grade nine curriculum. 
Um, at the workshops that were conducted in uh, 2022 and 2023, um, this, the teachers uh, that were there, when we were doing small components on coding, started to get really anxious with a lot of the, the uh, questions that we were doing and needed more time to process and be able to do some of the work uh, from those. And so it became apparent that uh, there was a lot of stress and frustration around the coding strand because of that, because of not having that information or not having that previous knowledge. Uh, many teachers uh, claim that they, they didn't have uh, schooling in coding before, or any experience at all, and so being able to teach that to the students was really difficult. And so we felt this year uh, when we were, the, the sessions on coding that were sort of expanded over four different sessions for teachers to do, like Sophia mentioned, um, it, we felt like it was really important at, in the first session to talk about uh, that anxiety and really get a, a, a chance to empathize with the teachers around that and have a full group discussion about some of the frustrations that came out of that. And then really hit home that coding can really help with logical thinking, with the, the idea of multi-step problems and algorithmic thinking for things that can go on forever, like looking at the first million prime numbers, for example. Uh, something along those lines, like it's really hard to do just by hand. And so if we can teach students to use coding uh, throughout their schooling, they can actually solve some of these bigger problems much more efficiently. And so we took the time to really make sure that we empathized with teachers and created uh, sessions that were sort of uh, lighthearted and uh, surrounded with some humor uh, so that they felt like this was a fun activity to do. And then also I was able to offer a lot of my uh, experiences with coding because I had really positive high school teachers who used coding to help me learn mathematics. And so I was able to tell them some of those stories so that they could hear how teachers can use this in their classrooms in a meaningful way. And so we started with some very basic foundational ideas like the idea of pseudocode or flowcharts, visual ways of looking at coding or or problem solving or being able to describe what uh, a problem is doing and then transferring it into code in the Python programming language. And the idea with that was really to get them to see that they're really just doing mathematics when they are coding. The pseudocode really provides a description of that algorithm and then they can transfer it over into code afterwards. And so that eliminated some of that anxiety as well for them to see like we're just really transferring mathematics to that computer programming language and then coming up with a way to solve it in general. And then at the same time, we were able to get teachers to start looking at, um, start to, well, to start looking at some of the foundational things like procedural statements and being able to do calculations in Python, as well as manipulations with strings. We tried to relate it to a bigger example. I was using the example of a Rogers invoice uh, to say that you know when you're trying to print an invoice, uh, you want to be able to manipulate text to be able to describe things on that invoice, but also manipulate numbers as well and do calculations to show things. Uh, because a lot of the times when you're doing foundational programming, like print, uh, print the statement, hello world, it's really difficult to see how that translates into something bigger for bigger problems. And so we kind of always went back to that analogy of the Rogers invoice to be able to say, we're trying to get the skills to be able to do something bigger like this, even though we're focusing on those smaller foundational pieces that are required for understanding. And then it, got, it started to get bigger over the first three sessions. We were able to uh, talk a little bit about um, the basics in the first session, but in the second session, we went on to conditional statements where we started to look at uh, selection structures and looping structures which are also part of like well, are also required for success in the grade nine curriculum for some of the problems that they would need to solve uh, and then the problem started to get bigger by the third session so we had teachers looking at whether they could put in a number and determine if it was prime we had uh, teachers putting in numbers like up to 100 but then some of them putting up to like three trillion to see what the the computer program could do, and then to see like the the ideal thing that program or coding could do for students in the classroom, like before, by doing things by hand wouldn't be as efficient. And so, modeling this allowed teachers to sort of see what kind of power coding could bring to mathematics in the classroom when students are modeling problems. And then we were able to create resources and get teachers to do problems uh, like these ones up here. 
Um, the idea was that they, they had something to take back to the classroom with them so that they had problems that students could do in the classroom that use things like uh, selection structures, looping structures, graphing and list structures. Uh, so the teachers have experience with all of those things, but then they could actually get students to work on problems like that in the classroom now. And so this series of three sessions that we've done already have provided a pretty good foundation for teachers uh, going into the classroom um, uh, to do that kind of work with them. And so I believe now, like the next session that we have is that teachers are going to create some kind of uh, lesson or activity around coding and then share their work with the rest of the teachers in that group. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, just to add a little bit more for Jeremy uh, introduction, he actually is a secondary school teacher in Peel District School Board. But on top of that, he's just been appointed this year as a de-streaming lead or coach. Yeah, de-streaming and transition. Yeah, that's it. Okay, de-streaming and transition teacher. Good, thanks. Uh, the title has changed a little bit. But on that same idea of focusing and supporting the school through this transition, and so that's really helpful. Uh, one of the things I just finished up with the coding was, was focusing on trying to find a way to think of the teachers who were there first as students to learn, then as teachers to teach, and then as being able to be facilitators of embedding and creating their own resources. And that's what that was about. There are a number of other things that are taking place in different school districts. And we've uh, invited Jason Toe along as the team. Uh, as I know the next group was also looking forward to having Jason here. He's actually at the airport uh, waiting for an airplane. So we're going to bring him on now and see if we have a chance there we can see him. So go ahead, Jason. We're ready to listen. All right. Hi, everybody. I don't know. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes. What I okay? What I can do also? I don't know if I can share my screen. I wouldn't mind um, just sharing a few images of the things that uh, we're also trying to do. So hopefully this is gonna work. Okay. Hopefully you see it. If you don't, just scream at me. Yes, we can uh, see it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so um, first of all, I really want to uh, and sorry for all the ambient noise. Um, really appreciate the partnership that uh, we have with OISE. One of the things that we really want to make sure that our staff feel and, um, and experience is that just like how we want our uh, students to have multiple entry points into mathematics learning, we want to have multiple entry points for our staff uh, to support their work towards effectively implementing the de-streamed grade nine curriculum. So um, I'm going to share with you some of the things that we're trying to do, uh, but also um, want to highlight that uh, the benefit of our uh, friends at OISE and Doug and Sophia and Jeremy and everybody is that they have been incredibly flexible and responsive to our staff and the needs that they want. And so coding has been um, a part that has been very well received because our staff um, have um, been able to uh, drive um, the learning that's taking place uh, through that partnership. So I want to just again thank uh, Doug and Sophia, Jeremy, and everybody over there um, in supporting our staff. Um, I just want to quickly frame sort of how we have approached supporting staff um, across the district for a few years now. And this is research from Dr. Do uh, Deborah Lowenberg Ball. And uh, she has identified several domains of mathematics knowledge that are required for staff or teachers to be able to teach mathematics effectively. So there is the pedagogical content knowledge. So how do you teach, right? That the teacher moves. Um, how do you how do you find out information about your students? How do you um, uh, have uh, strategies to meet, um, you know, various student readiness? But then there's also the mathematics content knowledge, like, like the, the, the not just how to do math yourself, but also the moves that a teacher needs to, to make in order to make math learning more accessible um, and, and build upon students' prior knowledge, right? Um, so I won't get into that, uh, but that is a really critical frame uh, that we have um, uh, in the Toronto District School Board is that it's not just how you teach, but also the math uh, learning in itself. So I want to share uh, that because the work that we're trying to do um, is trying to cover uh, many of these domains. So uh, we have, um, as uh, I think Sophia mentioned, that we have been working uh, very closely with Dr. Peter Olivia Dahl from Simon Fraser University, uh, who many of you know, and um, uh, last year embarked on, a, on, a, on an intensive system-wide professional learning 
on uh, building thinking classrooms, which really deals with the pedagogical content knowledge, right? Being able to support staff um, in, de in delivering effect, um, engaging con uh, uh, learning experiences for staff. So just want to let you know that we've been uh, working for the last uh, 12 months and, and, um, and on with uh, about 260 secondary teachers um uh, so that includes uh, well that includes about 220 teachers uh, and department heads as well as uh, 40 odd uh, school administrators which of course are very important in supporting staff um, in schools and and helping with the monitoring and, and the uh and those pieces um, but we know that de-streaming is also, oh, actually, it, yeah, is also not just happening in grade nine, right? Like uh, the work that we have to do hap needs to happen um, uh, in the elementary panel as well. And so we have also been working with our um, elementary teachers and we have so far uh, worked with over 900 teachers and we're going to continue to uh, do so. I wanted to share how this work translates into um, classrooms. Uh oh, there we go. Uh, and so in this image, you're seeing some of our youngest learners uh, over on the bottom left hand corner here. We have some teach uh, students in grade one and two, and we also have some of our oldest students over here. They're at our adult sites. So across the district, we are really working towards uh, transforming student experiences in mathematics, creating the conditions for them to work collaboratively um, and, uh, and and work in in a in a joyful way, because we know that after the pandemic, um, coming back to school and feeling joy and connectedness amongst uh, a community of learners is really, really important to us as a district. Um, we also know that, um, uh, like in Doug's uh, 10 dimensions, that uh, content knowledge is critically important. And so we are working with our primary teachers um, and to understand um, how students learn um, numeracy skills in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division through a developmental continuum. And so you're seeing this um, uh, continuum that's based on the research of uh, Dr. Alex Lawson um, at uh, Lakehead uh, University. And so we have been working with her uh, for a number of years now, but we are working uh, with our uh, math learning partners, which are uh, our term for our coaches, and they are providing intensive professional learning to uh, currently right now about 300 um, teachers across our district in our most priority uh, schools. They are not only have, taking them out to do professional learning, but they are also following staff and implementing this learning in classrooms. Uh, we are also, so that's primary, but uh, junior, so grades four to 10 actually, um, uh, teachers also require that um, uh, subject content knowledge. And so uh, we are zeroing in on fractions understanding, and we are going to be working um, in part uh, through um, a re uh, the research of uh, Dr. Kathy Bruce, and we're going to um, develop uh, teachers awareness of how do you how do you teach fractions understanding through a developmental continuum. Um, and uh, lastly, we've been working with, uh, you know, going back to our high school staff, um, for at least five years now, um, working with our department heads and math leaders and administrators and lead teachers around really the the core approaches to inclusive education in de-stream classes. So you see here one core pillar is universal design for learning. And there's three main pillars to that, having multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. One piece um, that uh, our, some of our staff, uh, like Anthony Malley, who you're going to be uh, seeing in a panel. He's one of our hybrid teacher coaches that works part-time in a uh, classroom, but also works part-time with um, with staff to support them is the use of computer algebra systems as a way for students to gain um, access uh, to grade level mathematics. Um, we also uh, are focusing on differentiated instruction. So how do we um, respond to student needs based on uh, their readiness, their interest, as well as their, their learning strengths um, and uh, areas of growth? And then lastly, uh, culturally responsive pedagogy. So really focusing on being able to understand the learner, but also 
um, uh, you know, realize that mathematics is a transactional relationship between teachers and students. And so because of that, there are um, there's opportunities, I suppose, for um, biases and um, sociocultural factors to influence not just how students take in the learning experience, but also how teachers deliver it. Um, so um, in a nutshell, uh, we have a lot going on in the Toronto District School Board um, to support de-streaming uh, beginning as early as kindergarten, because that is really where streaming begins in our institutions. Um, so anyway, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to beam in here at Pearson. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Jason. And <clears throat> I hope to hold the plane for you because uh, we're, we're uh, just coming to near the end of our presentation time. So our last uh, little bit, as we know, this afternoon uh, is an opportunity for you to ask lots of questions about and a discussion about it. But we do want to leave uh, about five or ten minutes now for you. To, if you have any questions at this point um, for us. So this is a question about your methodology. So you said that you are using document analysis as part of your methodology. Uh, did you? Why did you not use maybe video analysis and observation? Or you didn't mention those yeah. and you used them? Yeah, we didn't mention them. Uh, when we started this, we were still embedded in COVID. And so uh, the school districts that we were working with, so in Ottawa, Toronto, London, uh, and, and also in Calgary, would not give us permission to go into classrooms. So in the year one, it was actually to do interviews and we could do these workshops, but still couldn't get permission to go in and do the videos that we wanted to do. So we were focusing on how can we find ways to bring them to us rather than getting into their classrooms. Uh, we're hoping to extend the work that we're doing now to get into the, the actual classrooms themselves, to give teachers a couple of years now to them implement what they're doing and now we're looking for some best practices and we've submitted a, a, a CERT grant for that but that's we just couldn't get into the schools um, during the time yeah. um, just to just to add on that um, so yes in 2021 there could be no um, person contact in the second year 2022 that's when we we did the PG um, with with the teachers and we wanted to have more responsive in terms of you know, uh, teacher interviews. But now we did pass um, ethics, which this year, so this, uh, this academic year, we will be uh, able to go into their classrooms. So we do, we do have the possibility, it's now finding those relationships, which we've been doing um, you know, in this, the past three sessions that Jeremy was talking about. Uh, we've been doing some teacher relationships and we're hoping to to be able to go into the teachers' um, classrooms in the second term. I wanted to ask, so given that a lot of people, a lot of times a new initiative happens like de-streaming and then people with long memories or have been in the system for a while say, here we go again. So, and we are currently in the middle of the rerun called um, the instrument of torture called curse of handwriting has returned. So just to give one sort of uh, milder example, but when people say de-streaming has been tried before and people tend to, it, it contributes to initiative failure in education because people say, here we go again. And then they just assume it's going to fail. So what level of optimism or indeed pessimism did you encounter uh, amongst teachers you worked with? So uh, I'll start off and this, here are some other things. And let me give you a more general answer to the start of that, which is I was around for that previous round. I've been in education a long time. And so I've been around for lots of the different rounds. And I think one of the differences that is that the previous one with the, with the NDP, and we were actually trying to be streaming, but we also merged science and math together. We changed the leadership in the school from having a department head in math, department head in science, that become one department head, and et cetera. We, we did some things, it was a political change, rather than this one, which was more or less a ground roots change. We started the new curriculum, as we started in 2021, for example, but in a number of school districts, they had already done some 
some experiments, some, some work that had taken place. So TDFB, for example, in the year and two years before that, schools were already de-streaming their classes, putting everyone in an academic class. So in a sense, not having an applied classroom, putting them all together and teaching. And that was sort of a pilot that said, yes, there are some important things that we're doing here. Uh, some of Sophia's was, thesis was on some of this, so she'll talk about it, was well, there were some really good things that were happening. And the teachers were saying, we need to do this. The school boards were saying, we need to do this. And eventually, I th the way it feels is that the school, the uh, ministry got caught up and said, I guess we should be doing something different. So this one, I think, is embedded in research and in practice that is different from what happened before. Sophia actually did her doctoral thesis prior to this, so maybe she can talk to us on that. Um, yes, um, so in 2021, 2022, when it was the first year, uh, there was a lot more conversations around that. Uh, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it done before, and, I, and we, then we went back. Um, but I do know that, that then we continue those conversations and those con the, that kind of diminished in terms of uh, being an uproar. Uh, but I do see Jason Toe's hand up, and we have been talking about it during our sessions. So I think maybe Jason, um, if we can get him on, I don't know how to, there we go. Sure, I think um, one, uh, and, and Doug um, uh, explained it quite well. One of the other dimensions that I want to highlight is that um, this, t well, what happened in the 90s really wasn't grounded in um, a strong understanding of why uh, we're de-streaming. Um, I think a lot of people, if they knew and had the, the vernacular of what systemic racism, classism, ableism was, I think that perhaps there would have been more persistence amongst um, staff. I think um, because we, um, we, there is a generally, um, you know, greater baseline understanding of what those kinds of forms of systemic oppression is in, um, in, in society now and how we have intrinsically linked um, uh, streaming as, um, as a systemic oppressive piece within education. I think it's really hard to, um, you know, kind of put the toothpaste back in the tube at this point. You can't just be like, oh, okay, we're going to stream again when we have already made the link now um, and, you know, and, and something that is it I would see as an intangible is when people know that de-streaming is um, a morally just part of um, education, then there's more of um, there's, there's more persistence that I think staff will give it as opposed to this being just another fad of uh, the week. Um, so I'm I'm optimistic personally that we have um, really let people know, uh, teachers know, administrators know why it is that we're doing this. It is the how now, and I and and I know that teachers are uh, you know at different parts of the spectrum in terms of their ability to implement effective learning for a wide range of learners, and I and I know that there's a question in the chat for that too, um, but uh, I, I I feel like because we we have really done a pretty good job of explaining why um, a lot of staff have understood it. And now it's um, working with teachers and, um, and and trying the strategies out in the classroom and, and having them see uh, positive results. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so the question from the chat is from Ann Keander. Uh, and the question is, have you learned much so far about how teacher, teachers felt about and handled the learning of the students at the extremes, that is, high and low performing students? Uh, so we'll start with us. So we're just getting started into this round of asking their experiences about in their classrooms. Uh, we, do, we do have some data on it, but I don't think we've analyzed any of the extremes yet. Jason, I don't know if you've You've embedded in this uh, for a long time. Have you heard directly from from teachers about what they're experiencing? Yeah, I, I think that um, that is definitely on a lot of people's minds when um, they're working at a, you know, I guess if they're continuing to teach how they taught in a stream class in a de-streamed environment now, 
they, you know, a lot of teachers are seeing that, oh, I'm not servicing either end of the extreme because typically, you know, how you could teach in a stream class is kind of like teach to this amorphous middle and uh, there wasn't as much range. And so if, um, you know, if if practice is just translated from a stream to a de-streamed environment, then that's a real challenge. And um, and so that's why we have worked um, for a number of years now on things like what does universal design for learning look like in a math classroom, in a high school math classroom? Or how do you differentiate um, instruction? Um, you know, like it's just something as very simple as instead of giving one question, to all students to try, you give them two or three of varying difficulty that hit the same learning objective, um, uh, but are just at um, uh, at different difficulty levels, right? And it doesn't matter which one you do because you're still, I don't know, solving an, a linear equation or what have you. Um, but there's somewhere for anybody to go, someone, something to challenge students that are, um, you know, well on their way to, you know, meeting an expectation as well as students that are just on, on, on at the beginning. So uh, little tips and tricks like that are, are making their way across the system. Um, and it's, you know, with with any kind of large scale change like this, it's going to take some time. But again, because I believe that our our our, our staff generally understand why we're doing this. I think there is the level of persistence um, that we'll have that we didn't have in the first go around of de-streaming. Okay, thanks, Jason. Yes, go ahead. Okay, have you seen any of that in your data of the teachers talking about like why they're doing it? Like Jason's talking about in practice, that's what he's seeing. But are, are you seeing that any of that in your data? Um, one more time, why? Cause I can't... Like, did you, are teachers talking about why? Like he's talk, he just told us in his response that it's all about you know teachers talking about why the disc streaming, right? And it's like this bigger picture sort of thing. Are you seeing any of that in your data? Of of why? Yeah. Yeah. So they're very much explaining why because they're they, many of them are experienced teachers, and so they have found that that many students are finding themselves, particularly in the applied level of mathematics, not being successful, not going anywhere. They've got data that the students who are not successful in grade nine math are highly unlikely to be able to gra graduate, go on to other things. So many of them are talking about why this is important for some students who were not given the opportunities to move into different places. And we also saw it as those teachers who teach grade nine, who are also teaching grade 10 saying, I'm doing the same thing in grade 10. We're going to de-stream grade 10 in our school. Jeremy's had a little bit of experience. I'll get him to some of the work that he's done as well. So go ahead. Yeah, so some of the interviews that I've conducted for uh, the study, uh, I would say a general theme that I've been hearing, like I haven't analyzed it too, too closely, but a general theme that I'm hearing is that a lot of teachers are optimistic about de-streaming and for the reasons why that Jason mentioned. Uh, I think what really frustrates them the most are the challenges that they have not been able to figure out yet. Uh, like those lack of resources or the lack of time to really put into planning it. And so they really want to make sure that they have access to that so that they can do it justice. Do recognizing the time, it's 10, 59, 35 here on our clock. So we are going to stop to give the next group an opportunity to get here. So thanks very much for your attention here, those here in person and also online. And thanks, uh, Jason, for being able to share with us uh, your experience. Thanks very much.